Hello and welcome to Midweek Connection on February 22nd, Ash Wednesday, here at First Presbyterian Church of San Angelo. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Pastor Natalie. And today we're going to do what we typically do on Wednesdays, and that is to read our daily lectionary texts and talk about them a little bit and maybe even... Uh, maybe even learn something together, uh, uh, but certainly uh, with the understanding that God, through his Holy Spirit, does speak to us and wants to transform us into the people that he would have us to be. And so we're looking forward to doing that again here today. So uh, let me open this in a word of prayer. Uh, gracious Lord, thank you so much for your word to us today. Uh, Lord, I pray that as we read and as we pray and as we think about these uh, these texts that um, that you would be glorified in all things, Lord. We're so grateful for your love for us. We're grateful for the way that you uh, call us to be your people and respond obediently to your to your gracious and, and loving and, and life bringing word. Um, I'm just uh, thankful, Lord, uh, especially on this Ash Wednesday when we think about and celebrate actually the start of a new season in the church calendar, the season of Lent, one that is meant to be a uh, more contemplative time. Uh, Lord, I'm grateful that you uh, don't leave us alone, uh, that you uh, provide guidance for us, and that in all things uh, you are uh, expressing your love to us through your word. And so thanks for your loving word today. Um, in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to start with Psalm 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Give heed to my sighing. Listen to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I plead my case to you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil will not sojourn with you. The boastful will not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in awe of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Because of my enemies, make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouths. Their hearts are destruction. Their throats are open graves. They flatter with their tongues. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Because of their many transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, so that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover them with favor as with a shield. And from Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. For he is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the speed of the runner, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Our Hebrew scripture prophecy today comes from Jonah, and we're going to read chapters 3 and 4. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 
and the people of Nineveh believed God, they proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. No human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger, so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from the sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as children. My child, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, or lose heart when you are punished by him. For the Lord disciplines those whom he loves, and chastises every child whom he accepts. And your trials for the sake of discipline. God is treating you as children, for what child is there whom a parent does not discipline? If you do not have that discipline in which all children share, then you are illegitimate and not his children. Moreover, we had human parents to discipline us, and we, have, and we respected them. Should we not be even more willing to be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share his holiness. Now discipline always seems painful rather than pleasant at the time, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees, and make straight the paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. 
pursue peace with everyone and the holiness with without which no one will see the Lord. And our gospel text today comes from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. And back to our psalm, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You who have been my help, do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my mother, if my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And our final psalm today is Psalm 51. <laughs> Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me in a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise, for you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. 
then bowls will be offered on your altar. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I think we've got a lot of text today about repentance. <laughs> it only makes sense, right? It is Ash Wednesday. Uh, it is this time that we are intentional about um, practices of, of, of penance or penitence um, when we think about ways that uh, confessing our sins and receiving God's forgiveness, recognizing even the magnitude of our sins and the need for forgiveness in the first place is a, is a primary reason why we have this uh, season of Lent before, uh, before Easter comes in uh, 40 days plus all of the, all of the Sundays. Um, but where, where, where do you want to start today, Natalie? There's a, there's a lot of good stuff today. It's, 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 it's good. I, I don't know. Um. <laughs> How about we start with Jonah? Let's, okay, let's start with Jonah. Let's start yeah, with Jonah. Yes. Um, I just, I find it interesting with Jonah. Um, you know, he... You know, if we go back, of course, we know his resistance and, and he tries to run away and hide. And, of course, we know the story of Jonah and, and the big fish. And we know that it doesn't work. And uh, so here he is finally saying, okay, okay, God, I'm going to do what, what you're telling me to do. And he goes and he does what he is asked to do. And then exactly what God was calling him to do the purpose of that was to draw this this large city this 120,000 people to bring these people back to Christ and um, are back to God and and that's what happened instead of Jonah delighting in that instead of Jonah praising God for his graciousness and his mercy he's angry right. and he says, I would rather be dead. Right. You you went and you proclaimed these people's hearts were changed. God welcomed them back in and he's angry. Right. And that's just and on one hand you you read that and you're just like what is wrong with him? But how many times do we look at people right. and we want them to get exactly what they deserve? Right. And yet, we deserve the same thing. And, and then God goes and puts this tree over Jonah. It's like to protect him and to give him cover and protection from the elements. And Jonah's grateful for it. And then it's gone. And he's angry again. And it's just, he is a pouting child he got mad and said, just kill me. Well, you won't give me what I want. Fine. I'm going to, you know, cross it. You know, he's sitting over there right. pouting, excuse me, pouting because it didn't get done the way he thought it should have been done. He thought God should have come. The wrath should have been handed out. And when God didn't do that, Jonah somehow thinks he knows better than God. And he is a pouting child. That's fascinating, and God isn't it? still gave him provision right but yet also taught him a lesson right then took it just as quickly as he gave it he took it back right i think uh yes everything that you said uh pouting pouting children um it kind of makes me wonder like how how regularly god must look and say Come on, people. It's really not that hard. Um, you know, here we have four chapters. It's just if you, you know, there's there's the whole of book of Jonah. It's all right, <laughs> right there. And how people uh, really, you know, love the story of Jonah and the big fish. And it's like kids everywhere know this story and stuff. But do they ever get to this? Do they ever right. get to chapters three and the four? Anger. He did, they, did what right. he was called, and he is angry because God did what he because said he would God's do. Because God's character is exactly that. Uh, Jonah is angry at the character of God 
you know, is this not what I said was going to happen? And then he lists, you know, you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. Jonah knows the character of God um, and, and did not want did not want his enemies to be recipients of God's blessings because we'll be honest the Ninevites you know they were they were pretty terrible people uh, the the people of Israel and the Ninevites would uh, you know would be at uh, enmity with one another for, for a really long time um, and there were uh, uh, violent excesses you know uh, it's, is it possible that some of Jonah's immediate family, or at least people he knew, had maybe been killed in some of the violence that occurred in their battles and their wars. Um, would, if we had a list of all of the things that, uh, uh, all of Jonah's grievances, if uh, maybe we might understand better, right? You know, maybe, maybe Jonah has good reason. Well, we know Jonah has good reason to hate the Ninevites, but. What, but what really strikes me is he's, he's mad at God for demonstrating his character. Well, those would normally be things that I think that we would say in praise of God. Right. And he is spitting them yes. out as condemnation. Yes. And, uh, right. I, is, think, I think that's exactly it. Normally, we, we want these. We want, we, we right. worship God because, because he, he is things. these things. And, right. But how how quickly we can uh, how quickly those blessings can become curses if God chooses to use them in ways that don't line up with our own uh, understandings. Right. Yeah. You know. Um, you know. There there are conflicts going around. You know. You know. The world. You know. Even today, it's like you know, we think primarily about Russia and Ukraine. And um, imagine, I don't know, can we imagine a comparable situation where, like, what if God were to completely forgive and restore uh, your enemy? Like, would we, would we praise God for that, or would we curse him also? Um, you know, unfortunately, we live in a, fortunately, we live in the United States currently, and there aren't, you know, complicated problems I guess right. like international war going on with us at the right. middle of it but you know I don't know I think back to you know my 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 uh, family that fought in say World War II and, mm -hmm. and Korea and things would they be uh, would they respond this way if God had shown mercy on you know on the Japanese or on the Chinese at that particular time and you're like well I don't know so you know we have this it's it's in scripture it's right here uh, how do we how do we deal with this? Um, God's character, but we only want His character to apply to people we like, not to our enemies. Hmm. Uh, yeah, wow. So Hebrews, let's jump to Hebrews because Hebrews is always fun. Uh, chapter twelve. What a great um, therefore statement you know here's the list of everybody in chapter 11 all these faithful people therefore since we are surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses let's keep our eyes focused on Jesus you know the author uh, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith uh, but then you know the, that chapter uh, chapter 12 verses 1 through uh, 2 um, you know the just the first two tend to be like the fun stuff right but then it gets <laughs> a little bit harsh again like uh, we don't like to be disciplined. Right. But God disciplines those whom he loves. He disciplines his children because he loves right. them. Um, don't try to get out of that. I think about that even with, with um, my own children, and mm -hmm. of course you have children as well. You know, when they are young and you have these boundaries and you have these rules, right. it is because you love them. It is because you want them safe. You want right, them, right. Um, you know, they can't play in the street. Right. They can't, you know, um, you want good for them. You love them. And and therefore, you discipline them. And so it's funny that we have this 
father child role and yet we expect that none of this is to happen to us right. yet that is exactly hmm. what we do in our parent child relationships right. um, and so it's it's interesting that there's such a disconnect from that um, that idea that the Lord will discipline and that that is okay and that's that a, is, it's, it's actually better than okay it's, it's, it's what it's needs good, to happen right right he disciplines us for our good in order that we may share his holiness. Um, right, so how does this play out practically, Natalie? Because, you know, we, we are adults here and we are the ones who discipline our children. We aren't uh, under our own parents' authority anymore. Our parents right. don't discipline us. We think we've outgrown that, right? Uh, maybe like Jonah, you know? I like when that plant gave me shade and now right. that it's been taken away, I'm going to curse God and hope that I die. It's just like, what? Really? Right. Um, Can we not do better than Jonah? I don't know. But, but again, how does it take place? How does it take place practically? You know, that verse 14, the last one you read, pursue peace with everyone and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Uh, Peace and holiness. So it's it's Lent. Mm -hmm. Lent is um, a, a friend of mine wrote that uh, Lent was not just a time for fasting, but a time for feasting upon God's word. And I thought that was great uh, in line with if we're pursuing peace and pursuing holiness, um, what practices can we or should we be doing to do those things? You know, peace is not just tolerating other people's garbage. You know, right. peace is actually where there's a reconciled relationship. And, and holiness, again, it's, we think about God as the one who's holy, but he's calling us to be holy. Um, how, do, how do we do that? I think we have to embrace people. We mm -hmm. can't, like you said, it's not just a tolerance. Well, you know, I'll, I'll put up with them as much as I have to. Right. <laughs> um, but I think that we embrace one another in um, in the shortcomings, mm -hmm. and um, and that we care for them um, even when they are different, even when they disappoint us, even when they make us angry. Um, those God is gracious. God is just. He is merciful. Slow to anger, abounding for, in steadfast love. Yes, well. for us. And also for the people who irritate us. <laughs> and also for the people who irritate us. And I think that that would do us well to remember that. Well, uh, thinking about uh, thinking about church or any particular congregation of people mm -hmm. um, in in our faith tradition, we talk about being covenant partners with one another. Uh, covenant meaning a, a more than just a promise. Covenant of uh, being intentional to keep um, you know love present uh, mm -hmm. not again not just not just doing the bare minimum of not right. getting you know angry or irritated or whatever but being right. intentional about loving uh, as, as God made covenant with us through Jesus Christ that all who put their faith in Jesus would be would be saved mm -hmm. uh, but Jesus continues to work into in our lives to transform us you know he is fulfilling his side of the covenant um, and so within a church what happens when we get irritated with one another you know do we do we walk away do we quit do we go somewhere else um, if I'm not getting what I want. Um, well, you know, I don't know, going back to Luke and the parable that Jesus tells about the Pharisee and the tax collector, uh, it starts off, you know, Luke is sometimes really good at giving us the exact reason why he told the parable, right? In verse right. nine, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. And, and I kind of want to go, ouch, because... We look at people and go, well, I'm not that bad. Well, like, exactly. I don't do that. How, how, often, how often do we do that? Right, um, right. You know, maybe, maybe I don't see myself as being totally righteous, but I certainly see myself as doing pretty good sometimes. Decent human being. Well, right? Yeah. Like, you know, I, 
I, you know, I pay my taxes. I, uh, you know, I eat a balanced diet. I don't know. Like, what, you know, what are you going to say? Like, what, what would define you as being good, you know, or righteous in the first place? And again, I think if we look at God's standard of righteousness, where in Matthew, I know uh, Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. But here he is talking about people who think of themselves as righteous, and then that flip side, regard others with contempt. Right. I, think there, I think there maybe is a little bit of a difference there. Like I can think, hey, I'm doing the things that God wants me to do, and I can appreciate that other people are trying to do right. well also. Um, but when we have this contempt, when we right. have this disdain for others because they don't do things the way that you do, or you feel like they, or we feel like they, um, well, if you loved people, you would do this, or if you loved God, you would do this. Right. How would it look differently if you truly, if your heart was in the right place and we somehow condemn them yeah. um, or hold them in contempt, to use that word? Um, because it, it looks different. Um, it looks different than, than what we do. Right. Or, or you just, we don't know their heart. We don't know right. what is going on. Right. Um, well, Jesus makes this huge difference. You know, he takes the Pharisee on one side and the tax collector on mm -hmm. the other side. And so if, if Jesus is talking about two extremes in terms right. of behavioral difference in terms of life focus difference you know and and and, and those two extremes Jesus says the one that humbled himself received uh, the justification rather than the one that exalted himself but I think within our context I don't know if we're ever dealing with extremes to that extent you know right. it's not that we have Pharisees and tax collectors We've got people who maybe have differences of opinion that still fall within an orthodox Christian belief, right. and we can still treat each other with contempt. Uh, oh, I can't believe they say, you know, trespasses instead of debtors, you know, for a, a right. terrible example, you know. But there are things, just simple verbiage. Right. And that, right. Um, that becomes divisive. Right. Um, you you know, you look at, yeah, you can. You can look at the different denominations and what separates and their right. belief systems and whatnot and how we compartmentalize all of right. that. And a lot of it is verbiage. Or these people stand and these people kneel or these right. people come uh, in and, yeah, you know, know, genuflect yes. before the cross or these people take communion by dipping it mm -hmm. or sometimes by, tra you know, whatever, they're, right. they're, whatever it might they happen wine, to be. They have wine, they have juice. It's right. These have gluten-free. These have saltines. <laughs> uh, you know, just right. Mess right. But we use those things to divide ourselves right. rather than we all worship the same God. Right. We all celebrate the same risen Christ. Right. Right. Does he care that it's gluten free or saltines? I mean <laughs> To use a silly example. Right, right. Right. It, right. it is silly, but yet that something that silly has, has been used to divide. Divide. Right. And so um yeah, maybe we need to humble ourselves and say, just because it's different right. than what we would do. I might disagree with that person, but I can trust that God's character and love for that person is the same as his character being demonstrated for me. Right. And therefore, how do I treat that person? Mm -hmm. And if I can treat that person in a more godly manner... Um, even if there are disagreements, and some disagreements can be significant, I get that. Right. But but to not regard them with contempt, to to treat them as fellow humans, mm -hmm. uh, people created in the image of God, imperfect, still flawed, but forgiven, right. redeemed, moving towards Jesus. Uh, and, you know, some people might be, you know, uh, further along on the journey. Some people might be new Christians. Um, 
you know, can we expect people to act a certain way instantly as soon as they become followers of Christ? Or do we mock them for their behavior uh, because it's not sophisticated like my understanding? Right. Hmm. They're not mature enough in their faith or deep enough in their faith or, right. you know, they don't have the same level of understanding. Um, right. So I want to I want to just say that I feel like I'm doing really good at this. So I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. <laughs> You know, thank you, Jesus, that, uh, you know, this time of fasting during Lent, that I can experience more of your goodness and your and your mercy, unlike some of those other people that just don't know how to do spiritual practices right. I'm going to move over before the lightning strikes. <laughs> and yes, obviously but I'm playing yes. around, but, uh, but even but thinking that about that is really what some people, that is really what they right. think. Right. You off. No, sorry. no, no. I was, I was thinking. So, so our responsibility as as spiritual leaders in the church, um, how how do we exhibit um, patience and peace in our own um, exhortations? Because again, we have studied this a lot. You know, we try to put it into practice, but then there are times that we can get so very frustrated with people who maybe don't take the same amount of time. But, but again, our job as leaders is to be encouraging, uh, appropriately challenging. Right. Um, but, because there is room for correction. Right. There is room for correction. Right. And we right. do need discipline from time to time. There right. is room for all of those things. And so, like you said, just this appropriate level of, of pushback or uh, mm. accountability or right um, to use a very uh, non-biblical example um, so one of my children um, has a social media account now okay would you if you type it would you say it to the person's mm. face if you post it or say it would you say it in the grocery store line to a stranger? Hmm. Um, I think when we put ourselves out there, um, and obviously we're talking in community with the church, but even outside of church building, in our everyday lives, I think that we have a responsibility because it's not Sunday morning for an hour and 15 minutes while we sit in the pews right. that we are practicing right. what is here and hmm. we are practicing it is the other, you know, Sunday afternoon to Saturday night. We live lives that this should be in effect at all times. Right. And so right. outside of even the church community, how are we treating people? How are we interacting with people? And that does include, you know, it does include, you know, even those interactions that we have that may not be face to face, just as we are in this increasingly computerized age and all right. of these things, that is communication, text messages, mm -hmm. um, all of these types of communications that we have with people, I think that they need a measuring stick as well to fit into this um, <clears throat> because it's so easy to, well, that wasn't at church, or that wasn't, in, right. and so well, this right. this doesn't really count against me or whatever. Uh -huh. But I think that sometimes we need to really step back and look at as we look at how are we treating one another, how are we interacting with one another, you know, stop and really think about: Would you say that to someone's face? Would you take your phone out and share those images with your friends at lunch? Mm -hmm. And if they answer to any of those types of things are no, then I think that we need to take a step back. Something's not right. right. Um, you know, yes, you might not, you know, may not say that to somebody on Sunday morning in the church pews, but would you say it Wednesday at lunch or, right. or Thursday at, you know, whatever, right. whatever context we have in our life. Right. And so I think that's... Is our character being consistent with... Uh, with our best understanding of what Jesus would have us do all of the time, as opposed to just in compartmentalized areas. 
yeah, I think that is pretty hard in the church though sometimes, you know, especially, hmm, you know, dare I say it, there are some who occasionally come to church. Right. <laughs> and so they're not even hardly even in church practicing these things. Right. Uh, yeah, but again, but I think, again, uh, yes, I think you're right. Church becomes not just what we do uh, for an hour on Sunday mornings, but it becomes, you know, we, we are. it becomes who we are, right? Without, without the pride, without the contempt for others, uh, recognizing God's mercy and generosity and compassion and grace and forgiveness for us so that we can then do that with everybody. Yeah, right. uh, yeah, so that's a lot. That was a lot. I think that's a lot. And, and you know, we can hit every one of those psalms again today, oh, too. Good, um, good. Yes. You know, in, in light of the overwhelming goodness of God's character towards us, uh, how do we respond? Well, you know, with, with confession, uh, with gratitude, with praise, um, with hope, uh, with expectation mm -hmm. that, uh, that the relationship grows and deepens, uh, that the flaws that still remain in our lives you know, will eventually be uh, you know, made straight um, and that one day we'll, we'll see him face to face. Right. And recognizing, you know, unlike Jonah did, you know, recognizing yeah. God is God. Yeah. And that is and his role. Not. And we are not. <laughs> and we are not. Right. Um, and so um, we are not. And sometimes that requires discipline. Mm -hmm. um, because his, his will, his plan is good. And we don't have to understand it. Right. Um, and when he asks us to do things, we don't have to understand them. We don't even have to agree with them. Right. Well, that was that's that's good. I think. Um, yeah, I think it's probably time to close. All right. <laughs> All right. No, we had a lot today. Yeah. All right. Gracious and loving God, thank you for your character. Thank you that you do have a character of graciousness and mercy and justice and righteousness and forgiveness and that that is offered to each of us and that is offered to those that are not like us. Help us to do better. Help us to love those around us um, in spite of our differences. Help us to embrace one another Help us to love one another so that we may be more like you and that we may love you better. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I certainly hope you can join us tonight if you're in the San Angelo area. We have our Ash Wednesday service from 6 to 7 o'clock tonight here in the sanctuary. And uh, church again on Sunday morning, two opportunities to worship at 9 and 11 15, Sunday school in the middle. And uh, let's, uh, as hopefully we'll be able to continue to do midweek connection through, uh, through the Lenten season, but if you are interested in um, starting up uh, or uh, resuming a spiritual practice as you know, fasting or, or feasting on God's word or prayer, uh, and if you'd like some assistance with that, you can call up to the church and you can talk with Natalie or with me and we can uh, help you along those lines, but would love to continue to uh, be in prayer together. So I uh, look forward to seeing you when we can and um, I hope you have a blessed day. Take care. Bye-bye.